However, being local and knowing some kids that went there for school or maybe played a different sport there, you kind of have an ever loving, I don't know, everlasting love for the Mac in the Midwest. I think, I think that's a fair thing to say. And there's a great podcast out there. The Mac connection podcast, check it out. If you haven't, that dude is all over every sport in the Mac and just loves it. So I respect the hell out of that because it's obviously not the biggest named conference out there and has just produced more ugly than it has good over the last years. However, they did take down one of the members of the mid three last year. So maybe they're not as bad as we think. Oh, they did. They, they, they did. I can't remember who it was. JP, uh, do you remember? I, I, yeah, I don't remember either, but all right, that, let's, let's talk to Mac. We have our team split up evenly. Let's start with Jake who is awfully quiet during that conversation for some unknown reason. Let's open it up with Western Michigan and take us through the Mac. Man, I thought you'd actually have me starting with Ohio. We'll start with Western Michigan, though. We, we can do that. Uh, what about Western Ohio? Michigan, if you guys follow us on socials, I kind of highlighted like one thing you need to know about this team. Uh, I'm going to do it again because I think it's worth noting. Mac freshman of the year is returning. Sophomore running back Jalen Buckley. He's going to be a stud. He's going to be the workhorse for them. Uh, I think they know who their quarterback is going to be. I think the kids stepped in like five games in at the last five games of the year last year. But Buckley, was he was stable for them, and I think he's going to be another workhorse, and they kept him out of the transfer portal. So that was really good. Uh, I see him being kind of a first-team, second-team, all-Mac guy, especially like I mentioned before with Penny Boone being gone. Western Michigan changed both coordinators. Uh, it was Lance Taylor's first year. Last year, they went four and eight, but they're pretty high up uh, as far as returning production goes. So I think they can make a turnaround, um, but they're going to try to have to keep their confidence high because they have to go to at Wisconsin and at Ohio State the first two weeks of the year. I think if they can get through that healthy, um, I think this team couldn't make a turnaround and actually fight for five, maybe six wins in the max. So. All right, good opener there in Western Michigan. PJ Flex Old School, if you remember those days, the Corey Davis days, that was kind of their peak. And Minnesota also plucks players from that school now. Yeah, so PJ they Flex still do. Has ties. Yeah, they definitely do. They did lose their offensive coordinator, though. And uh, let's move on to JP. Sorry, Reese, we're going to jump in. We'll come back to you. But JP, take us through Northern Illinois, a team picked in the top half of this conference. Yep. Northern Illinois, historically one of the better teams in the MAC, one of the better programs in the MAC. This is kind of my de facto MAC team. Every conference, I got one team that I'd usually pick to root for a little more than others. Uh, DeKalb only being about four and a half, five hours from where I'm at makes it pretty easy. I know people around the DeKalb area, some people have gone to school there. This is a team that won seven games last year, but kind of quiet seven games, mostly because they just weren't themselves like Rocky Lombardi was still your quarterback and he was way beyond solid for this program really helped him out. But this is a team that came off the year before, like with a lot higher aspirations and they just kind of sat in the bottom to the mid pack of Mac a season ago, um, a higher returning per production percentage than most of the Mac, I would mm -hmm. say in some spots, uh, especially throughout the defense. And it's a team that's going to play, pretty solid defense for most of the year. Uh, the back end DBs are good. These are really, it's a really good secondary for the Mac. Probably you could have the argument, the best in the Mac, uh, if you could take in your safeties and your corners as well. So what can they do to improve themselves, improve themselves in 2024 and fight for a Mac conference title? Well, the one thing for me was, can you really find the quarterback you need for this year? You got to re replace Lombardi it's going to be tough, but you're going to have some workhorses. Um, and Terry O'Brown, the running back, is an absolute workhorse. You're going to have really good run game. It's just you need the quarterback. You really need the quarterback to be good, and they're not sure where they're going to go with it on the situation um, on how it lays right now. So if you're Northern Illinois and you're looking at your schedule, right, you're going to make your money going to play in Notre Dame. You're going to make your money playing NC State. Um, and then it's like, you grabbed yourself a Western Illinois, historically not great FCS program. You grabbed yourself Massachusetts, a historically not good program in general. Like there's opportunities to win games here, right? And they get some of the better Mac teams at home. They get Toledo at home. That's going to be a tougher one. Central Michigan, they get them at home. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity for this team and this program to get back on track. And honestly, if Hammock wants to be in a job in the next couple of years, I think they got to fight for the conference title in the next couple of years. So um, NIU, 
just hoping the quarterback situation gets solidified and they feel comfortable with it and they don't have to work too much uh, just to keep the ball in the running back's hands and moving the football downfield more than one dimensionally because that's what it felt like at times a year ago. Yeah, Rocky Lombardi was one of those guys that always showed flashes there, but also caused a lot of the issues that offense had. I mean, back at Michigan State, he seemed to be a better player. He like played down to that level when he got there. So we'll see how they react this year. And going to South Bend week two is never easy. But all right, good preview there. Let's move back to Reese. Reese, you're going to take us through Buffalo. Buffalo Bulls, three and five in conference last season. Guess what? Their first win in conference last year. 13 10 thriller over Akron in overtime. <laughs> um, and then this is uh, was it Pete Lembo's or is their new head coach this year? This is their second yeah, head correct. coach in, in four years. Uh, fun fact Lance Leipold was a coach of the Bulls for five years before that. So since he's left, they've had two coaches in four years. So it hasn't been smooth Never sailing. Recovered. Um, and then just because coming off of JP's fact, uh, stature about uh, NIU, we got to keep this in the back of our head uh, when it gets to be this time of the year. But when they play NIU, we're taking the Huskies because they're one and twelve against them lifetime, and they're two and nine against Ball State lifetime against them too. So, ain't looking like it's gonna be that great up there for Buffalo this season. Three and nine, like I said, they're were, they're were fourth in the East last year. Didn't have all that much success. Um, but when you get a new head coach in, you know if you're a fan base, there's always the hope that he can be the guy. Uh, which is gonna be what can he instill within year one? Uh, they open up the road with with an easy game against Lafayette, not Louisiana Lafayette, Lafayette. Uh, and they go on the road to Missouri too. So that might be one you don't want to watch the whole time, but you're going to go get paid some money to go play um, down in Columbia. So, <laughs> All right, that was a good one. Um, let's keep it rolling. I know we're running long here. I want to move it on to Eastern Michigan. I'm going to take you through Eastern Michigan. Team pick to finish kind of in the middle of this conference. This team last year was so injury-ridden. I think they're just happy to be healthy, to be honest with you. They lost three defensive starters their first game of the year that they never got back. That defense was still decent. I mean, they put up six wins. They finished six and seven. They go to a bowl game and just get obliterated by a pretty good South Alabama team. I don't think people would disagree with me there that South Alabama just out-talented that team from start mm -hmm. to finish in that game. Then this year, they finally get a quarterback. They struggled at quarterback last year. Now you bring in a, a Buffalo grad transfer in Cole Snyder, who in two seasons with Buffalo threw for 31 scores and 17 picks. Maybe you got the fix that you need. I mean, they got to stay healthy. That's a big thing too. But they also have another backup ready to go with more experience, and that's Minnesota transfer Drew Viotto. Viotto, he didn't play much, obviously, behind 11-year senior Tanner Morgan back at Minnesota, if you remember that. He was literally there for 100 years. So he didn't play much. He still got some eligibility, so they have at least that safety blanket that they should always prepare themselves for because it killed them last year. They lost three running backs last year, one to the portal, two to graduation. They go and replace them with an NC State transfer in Delbert Mims the third, who had eight scores for the Wolfpack last year. So you got to feel good about your backfield. Maybe you're scared about the depth because you lose three. You bring in one quality. You got to expect he's the starter. It just seems like Eastern Michigan always has that depth issue within the MAC that kind of shoots themselves in the foot. They're rebuilding their offensive line, who was terrible last year. They gave up 32 sacks. Last year, their offensive line did. They bring back two starters. Hopefully, they weren't the problem. They bring in two transfers and then one senior who just didn't play. So I can't imagine he's the best in the world if you're not playing on an offensive line that gives up 32 sacks in a season. But Eastern Michigan's just that middle of the pack team. That's all they're ever going to be. Because on the defensive side of the ball, they have some spotlights. They have they bring in Coastal Carolina's linebacker JT Killen, who posted 65 tackles and has 55 collegiate games under his belt. He'll be kind of the leader within that linebacking core and defense because he's played 55 games. There's not many people out there that play that many games within their career, especially in college. On the defensive line, they're led by Peyton Price, who's rumored to be going to the NFL next year. And then Justin Jefferson. No, not that Justin Jefferson. It's a defensive lineman for Eastern Michigan. He posted 11 quarterback hurries last year, but it's just a team that couldn't put it together. They do have some young talent at the cornerback position from Daquan White, who had 12 pass breakups last year. He's looking to build off that. He's expected to be an all-MAC player this year. The keys for him, stay healthy. Sometimes their tough branded ball, as they always like to pitch on that gray turf, isn't the way when roster spots one through 15 are injured and out for the year. 
I don't expect a ton from him. I think a six and six repeat season is kind of on the docket again, unless they get exceptionally improved offensive line play, which it's it's hard to turn around and replace three offensive linemen and have. I mean, you might have a more successful year than giving up 32 sacks, but it's hard to turn it around into more than six wins at the collegiate level. I think the ceiling is seven and the offensive line needs to play, but good. Anybody on anything on Eastern Michigan, I think this is going to be a popular rebuild team, by the way. That would be my one comment. I got nothing on them. Yeah, I know. We're still learning about them. I think I'll tell you this. When I started to research with them, I had no magazine in hand at that point. And I tried to look it up, tried to look at their own. So maybe a blog, nobody cares about Eastern Michigan. I think central (laughs) Michigan and Michigan take up majority of that fandom and Eastern Michigan just lies around. There's not a podcast dedicated to them. Nothing. So I hope (laughs) I get you all. Max Crosby cares about them. He's building the football stadium for them. That's fair enough. That that's true. And Max Crosby doesn't put out any content that would be helpful to people like us. I'll tell you that much. So hopefully his money's working better. All right, let's go to the next one. And I believe we're going back to Jake and Jake, you are taking us through central Michigan. Yeah. I, when we look at central Michigan, I think it really, it sounds basic, but I think when it comes down to this team, it's just going to be like, what can we do at quarterback? You bring in Joe Labus, uh, the Burt Emanuel Jr. kid also is back this year. Joe Labus is a um, Iowa transfer for those who are familiar with that name. I think it comes down to those guys. They lost 16 guys in the por- portal. They brought in five, which isn't a big deal. I think they have a decent amount of production back, but uh, it doesn't. It gets a little tricky with their non-con. They have Illinois and San Diego State. They also have to travel to Toledo, to Miami of Ohio and Northern Illinois. So I I think this team's good enough. I think that they have enough back with their running backs that they can kind of rely on that like they have been. But honestly, they got to they got to lean on a quarterback who's consistent. And I think defensively, you're going to be at least serviceable uh, McMillan. So, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I They go to Illinois, what is that, week three? And then, yep. thank God they host San Diego State because I've heard San Diego State's new stadium might be the most home field advantage in college football because the way they built it, it just bakes so in there. Like I heard it's so hot. So that's a good thing that they drew them at home. But Illinois on the road, I think Illinois takes a step forward this year, a little precursor to our Big Ten preview. But that's a tough one. So we'll see how the chips do in 2024. All right, moving on. Let's go back to Reese. Reese is taking us through Kent State. Talk about the Golden Flashes, Reese. Uh, if you're a Golden Flashes fan, plug your ears. Um, they went Do they, have eight. Eight. they went zero and eight last season. Do you can you get or in conference last season? Can anybody in here name me their only win last year? Who they beat? Uh, Fordham. Was it was it an FCS Herman. school? I, Central I don't, Connecticut. Not, I don't even know. Shout out. There you go, Park. Central <laughs> Connecticut State University. That is like uh, 31 to 10 at home. Blue Devils. Um, and then if you're if you're looking at their schedule for this season, which I think if you're going to talk about this team, you have to look at their schedule. Um, their f- first three of their first four weeks are absolutely brutal. Oh they open up God. on the road at Pitt. Then they get St. Francis at home. Then they go on the road to Neyland. And then they go on the road to Beaver Stadium. Uh, it's not looking promising for old Kenny, Kenny Burns. This is second season there at the helm. Um, and yeah, whoever their AD is just doesn't like this guy because it is not a, uh, they'd get really sled to start, man. Well, they gotta, they gotta make some money. Gotta make some money. Yeah. Yeah. Max schools are notorious for going through hell. Bringing these players are not getting or something. Uh, I don't know, man, but that's tough. Was Kent the team last year that went down to Georgia? No. the year? Who not was down in Georgia year. last year that gave – somebody was at Georgia game? last year, and then the week before they were somewhere massive too, like back-to-back years. Like they, that's what they do. They believe themselves dry yeah. the first couple of weeks. Dude, whoever scheduled this, I said earlier somebody chose violence. Come on, man. You go to Tennessee and to Penn State back-to-back weeks, you might not have a team left to play a conference schedule. Remind me to take not. Fred with Penn State. I'll take the uh, the backhand of that of that yeah. schedule. I'll take I'll take Penn State spread that day. That's that's a good call too. But oh the number is not going to be big enough. 
<laughs> plug your ears indeed. I don't I think they're gonna be they're gonna gouge their eyes out before the season starts. That might be one of the more challenging G five schedules I've seen so far. Um, but all right, Reese, that was a good one. Let's jump to JP. JP, you are taking us through Bowling Green. Yeah, Bowling Green is one of my favorite ones to talk about that I've looked at so far this season. This is a program who's historically been at the bottom of the conference and has found a way to continue to get their footing and be better. And they won seven games last year, went bowling, lost to a five and seven uh, Minnesota team in a real grinder of a bowl game a season ago. I don't know if you know playing quarterback this year, but he's back again. His name oh, is Connor Basilak. Yeah, the uh, kid you stole with a that guy. guy. I am notorious for saying that Connor Basilak was going to be way better than Michael Pettix at Indiana. That did not happen. He ended up at Bowling Green. But Yikes. nonetheless, so nonetheless, favorite. we're wrong sometimes. I think this is a team that's so veteran that they're just going to step up and wins just because they've gotten older and they've gotten a little more experience under their belt. They're going to be good in the trenches. They're going to have an experienced quarterback in Basilak. What are you going to be able to do? to take that next step and fight for a conference title because it does feel like there's the three teams above them that has more of a shot to get in there. That would be your Toledo's, um, your NIU's, things like that, Miami of Ohio's. But they got to take a step forward. It's going to be a very balanced attack. They're going to be very you like pretty close to 50-50 in the run pass world. They're going to be balanced in the fact that they play complementary football and offense and defense. They're not going to beat themselves. They're going to put themselves in positions to succeed. A kind of way Iowa tries to do with, you know, playing field position and playing things out. Now, can Basilak be good without the problems? Can we not turn the ball over? Can we make smart decisions? That's a big part um, of this team, but I think they're going to be very solid. I, I don't see a world in where they win less than seven games. I believe their win total I have here at six. I could see eight. Uh, your schedule is not brutal, but you do get at Penn State, at Texas A&M, and back-to-back weeks. So you're one and two playing Old Dominion, who's solid. Old Dominion's a solid team, but you get them at home. Like, let's go chase eight wins if you're Bowling Green for the first time in a while and really launch this program, you know, into hopefully a very successful next five so years. Yep. All right, that was a good one. I'm going to move on to Toledo, a team that's been mentioned a few times. Toledo is a team that won the recruiting battle when you're talking about Mac. They finished nine spots ahead of the second team within the conference at 68th overall nationally. So they can bring in some talent there. However, what you're trying to create if you're Jason Candle and their head coach is an 11-win season when your two biggest offensive producers transfer out. But you do bring back six all-conference guys, so that's a plus side. That's why they're expected to still be at the top of this conference. They bring in first-team – I'm not bring in. They return first-team Jurgen Newton at wide receiver position, Jaquez Stewart, who is an awesome kick returner for them last year, and then safety Max and Hook, who we'll talk about a lot later. If you look at their offense, they scored 32 points a game last year, which was a lot of their success, as I mentioned. But you transfer out to Quan Finn. You transfer out Penny Boone. That's a decent chunk of your production right there. Who do you replace Daquan Finn with? Well, you got to go and take a look at a guy who played in the Barstool Sports Arizona Bowl, went 14 for 34 for 184 yards in Tucker Gleason, who's a junior. So you're asking him to fill big shoes, and it's not a guy who can really do that through the air, it seems. I mean, you're talking about a bowl game where you're probably seeing some second stringers, maybe guys had already transferred out, and you went 14 for 34, not really a stat line that you would hang on the fridge if you're in the paper. However, like I said, you return a lot of good skill position guys. So they'll have an outside option. They'll have an outside weapon as an option that they can use within this offense. And then you got to take a look at The yards per play last year, six and a half yards per play. A lot of that was Penny Boone, man. That was a really, really good offense because they could run the ball so effectively and it opened up things for Finn. They get Jaquez Stewart back, who's rushed for 1,300 yards and 10 touchdowns over the past two seasons. So he'll have to take on a bigger role and fill the shoes of a back that was obviously within the wrong conference. I just don't know on this team, man. It's questionable. However, I think what makes me feel really, really good about them is their schedule, which I'll touch on at the end. On the defensive side of the ball, this was the third best defense in the MAC last year. I think they could be better. We talked about Max and Hook earlier. He was so good last year. He had 70 tackles and three picks. He missed five games, and he still got 70 tackles. 
So this dude, this is kind of like the same thing that you're trying, you're kind of getting if you're the Philadelphia Eagles with Quivion Mitchell, who you lose. You bring in a transfer on the opposite side at corner who should be pretty good. I mean, you're you're trying to replace these guys that made up a lot of your success, but I think they did a pretty good job at it, to be honest with you. And looking at their schedule, you open up with Duquesne. Your toughest matchup is an SEC matchup on the road at a lost Mississippi State program. Like this team has, if they can get through that game in Starkville, I think this team could like pretty much go undefeated. This team's schedule is not tough whatsoever. I really don't see a game that jumps out. Like they don't have the back-to-back power four matchups that jump off the page. Do you play UMass in week two? You're going to start 2-0 and rolling into Starkville. Then the game after that's – I would debate that Western at Western Kentucky is going to be as tough as a game at, at Mississippi State. I mean, that school is as lost as they can all be right now. So I really expect a good year from Toledo. I think it's going to be a, a good job. It's going to show a good coaching job in replacing the pieces that they lost. So I, I'm high on Toledo this year, and I'm sure we'll talk about them when it comes to conference championship time. Anything I missed on Toledo you guys wanted to mention? Any? Nope, no, no. Okay. Let's jump on to the next team. We're going back to Jake. Jake, take us through the Ohio Bobcats. Yeah, the Ohio Bobcats, a team that I believe lost 24 players in the transfer portal, uh, including both of their quarterbacks, one beating Court Curtis Rourke. He's off to Indiana. Uh, mm-hmm. CJ Harris, who played a ton when Rourke was out with injury, he's heading to Cal. So I honestly have a question for the public. And I don't know because I've been trying to look this up and, I, and I'm and i not sure. They have Parker Navarro as probably who's going to be in the starter. He played in the bowl game. Um, the Gunner Gundy kid, Mike Gundy's kid from Oklahoma State, transferred in. But then I also saw he's listed on 247 as transferring out. So I don't know if he's on the roster. I, I couldn't really picture him up. So if he is, maybe it's a it's a it's a battle between Navarro and Gundy. But right now Navarro is probably seen as the guy. I, I just think with all of the guys that they lost over the offseason, and I'm not really sure why. I don't I don't know what what the story was behind that. I, I think that Ohio is going to take a step back in terms of you know the success that they've they've recently had and we're kind of accustomed to seeing Mac them not being the best in the Mac, but more of a, a third or fourth place team overall. Um, I I don't know. I, FPI right now I think has them around six ish wins, uh, but that's not really something we're accustomed to. It makes me think what's kind of going on there. I don't I don't really know. Yeah, that's a weird one. I don't know. I haven't heard of Gundy transferring out so. I would think he would probably compete and win that starting job. If not, I mean, he has power for experience, very minimal. His biggest play in his career was down 48, nothing shaking his hand. That's the one you see all the time. So that would be an interesting story to follow, but let's move on to Reese. Reese is going to take us through the zips of Akron with a top five worst rebrand of all time. Take us through it. Reese. Good thing on like it's, on. it's all right. Boom. We can talk about the rebrand. Go back to the zip <laughs> yeah, it's, logo. It's okay. Right. He's he's been gone for a while. Get, yep, he's just got to get into the motion. We're good. He's still, still muted. Still not talking, Reese. God, he's still going. You're still he's still muted. He's still adamant that he's going. Yeah, there <laughs> it is. I was talking the dog. Guys, calm down. Whatever. <laughs> all right, here we go. Either way, uh, one in seven last year in conference. So this is gonna be another tough year for all you Zips fans. Uh, one did, and seven in conference did, last did Reese season. Get Akron and Kent State. Yeah, Reese and I also took Buffalo. I took the I took the I took the bottom three teams that finished in the East. Just a heads up. Um, but they they have a, they have a, a tough uh, three out of four weeks too. Not as tough as uh, Kent Kent State, obviously. But they open up with at Ohio State. Whatever that spread is, I don't think it's going to be big enough either. Um, and they also go on the road to Poughkeepsie, and then they get Colgate at home, and they go on the road to South Carolina. So. Doesn't look promising for the Zips to start off the year. Um, it's Joe Moorhead's third season with the program. He's four and twenty overall. Um, didn't bring a whole lot in through the portal. Uh, he's been a, he's been a part of winning programs. He was a head coach at Mississippi State before. Um, he's also a part of the Oregon program. Um, so we'll we'll see what he has in store for this year, or not not Oregon or Oregon and then Penn State as well too. So we'll see what he has in store from this year. But it, it's a rough opening for the year. You got to hope when you get to. I think they just got to get through these three out of four weeks with everybody healthy. So that way those guys can just get some experience. That way when conference season rolls around, you get guys who are a little more confident playing at home is going to be a little different than playing um, in Columbus in, in the shoes. So 
can help I build believe, some college for those guys. I believe that game in Columbus is either the 230 slot on CBS or it's big noon. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's the 230 slot on CBS. So not only are they opening in the shoe, they're opening in like CBS prime time, the first big 10 game in that slot. So good luck. Yes. Yeah. To All be right, fair with good. Akron, they they were in a lot of games last year, but just could stop turning the ball over. Like they played good defense, they're top forty and like yards given up, but they just could not stop turning the ball over. So hopefully, maybe if they get to like similar spot, they start getting those one possession games to flip. They did almost take down that Indiana team in that game. That was an ugly one that Indiana just outlasted them in overtime. I do remember that. All right, down to JP. JP, tell us a little bit about the Ball State Cardinals this year. Yeah, Ball State. Let me tell you something about Ball State. Uh, they have one of the uglier helmets in the country when they had the black lid and it just says Ball State in like impact font. It's rough. We got a great logo. Use it. All right, you're welcome. Just looking at Ball State right now, quarterback issues could be another situation here with this program. Uh, right now, I think... Uh, the Caden Samanza kid is going to be slated for it. He's just a freshman, uh, but the Aiden Luffler kid at backup is going to, one of them is going to have to take the reins because this is a team that really needed it a season ago and didn't get a ton out of it. So mm -hmm. when you look at Ball State, new defensive coordinator, a ton of guys left the program. They only got like two returning starters on the defensive side of the football. You can't stop anybody. You can't win football games, especially in the MAC when we get into those weird midweek games in the MAC. And the ball is just, I mean, with who Miami of Ohio is, who Northern Illinois is, and what Toledo has proven they can do, these are all teams that could run the football down your throat and not even blink about it. So got to pay attention to that. If you're Matt, if you're Ball State and you're looking, how do I get back towards the middle top of the MAC? I think you're going the right direction. Um, if you could just find an identity again. I mean, it just feels like it's had a big exodus out of the program. They had a good couple of years. I believe in the COVID year, they played for a conference title or even in 21. Just find a way to get back into that rhythm. It's not going to be on the defensive side this year. I think they're in a weird spot. Um, but if that, I don't think if they win seven games, if they win six games or so right now, you're looking for a new coach next fall. So Ball State, there's not too much interesting on this, especially when we're doing it in June. We'll have more um, for a lot of these teams later, but there's not a ton on Ball State that you need to know and be really blinking at unless they're on your team schedule. All right, that's Ball State. We got one very important team left to wrap up tonight's previews. We're going down to Jake to talk about the defending MAC champs, Miami of Ohio, picked to repeat by most. Jake, tell us about them. Yeah, I think for good reason they're picked to repeat. Uh, it's just a matter of can they get through probably the first three weeks of the year, and we could touch on that too in, in just a minute. But Chuck Martin's going into his 11th year. I believe that was the first time they won 11 games since Roethlisberger. If I, you got to might fair that you might those are Roethlisberger back. teams that lost to Iowa too. If you wanted to have yeah, fun with yeah, that, fun fact. Sick, sick brag. Congratulations, guys. Jordan. Hey. So that's just how much like it's been a process for Chuck Martin. He's had it over the past decade and they were really at the top last year. And I think they can do it again. Um, they lost a running back to Ole Miss. They lost, lost a pretty good defensive end to Oklahoma, but they did replace a couple of guys from like Louisville through the transfer portal. So there's some power for talent that's going back to Miami. Um, it's the theme. It's such a stupid comparison, but like, it really does come down to quarterback play with this team because they have an important name. Like we're going to talk about probably guys in this conference. Brett Gabbert is probably the most recognizable name in this conference. Now that some of those Toledo guys have yep. left, he's coming back for his sixth year. He hasn't played guys in all 12 games since 2019. I think last year he played in Jeez. eight. The year before that might've been four. Uh, so I don't know if we can get a full year out of Gabbert, they're led they They lead ESPN's FPI rankings for percentage to win the conference. So out of all the teams in the Mac, their percentage is the highest. Their record is sent around seven and five because they play Northwestern Cincinnati and Notre Dame to start the year. Like I said, they can get through that. Gabbert can stay healthy. I think it's clear and cut that this is the best team in the conference because I just think Toledo lost too much last year. And for Candle not to win the conference with with that talented team at Toledo is just uh, he lost his chance because I think it's yeah. Miami's to take. I agree year. with you. It's, it's it's a little bit embarrassing at Toledo, but going back to the first two games of the schedule, Jake, you got North at Northwestern and then you get Cincinnati at home. You got they beat last year. Drop. You got to think they get one of them though. 
right? Like you've yeah, got to think they get Cincinnati think, at home it, or they go on the road at Northwestern right on the lake for in front of 15,000 and get that one. It's not like I you're think walking they could, in a tough environment. I think it's reasonable they could get both if, if all things click. I think, honestly, the returning production for Northwestern is really bad on offense, so week one's going to be rough for them, jet meshing and everything together. They won at Cincinnati last year, and I don't think Cincinnati's – really getting any better so right i think they have an opportunity to maybe yeah maybe they shock the world and then when they go to south bend in week three yeah i think if you start two and oh there you got to feel really good about repeating and they as they should because you mentioned what toledo lost but all right that's every individual team preview of the mac now let's go to the grand scheme things let's talk conference title game and conference champion let's let jp open it up yeah, I'm not too exciting here. Uh, I have Miami of Ohio in this. I have Northern Illinois as your other one. I agree with Jake in the fact that I just, whether Toledo's good or not, I think it's too much to replace. It would be kind of funny, though, if everybody was on Toledo to win a title the last two years of the conference and they didn't, and then everybody gets off of them, and that's the year they go win it. Uh, I could see that. We see it all the time with Washington last year and a couple others. Uh, but I have Miami of Ohio over Northern Illinois in your conference champ being the Red Hawks. All right. I like that. I'm going to take the opposite side, which you just said. I'm going to say Miami and Toledo again. Give me Toledo. I think this year they can get it done. It sneaks in Miami on top of the world. All of a sudden Toledo sneaks in and this is the year they get it done kind of when nobody expects them to because they lost the star power they lost. So I think Toledo wins the Mac in 2024. Reese, what do you got? This Man, kid's got to stay off the mute button. It's the <laughs> it's just it's first, the dog. First the dog. The, the dogs over here barking stuff, so I got to mute it out of respect for out of respect <laughs> for the listeners. Uh, but I got Miami, Ohio, and Toledo. Um, I went chalk. Uh, I mean, when you look at these two coaches, they combined for four of the past seven MAC titles. So I think it's hard to go away from one of these guys. I'm going to lean Miami, Ohio, to win it. Um, I just think they bring back too much. Um, and I just think if they're going to be going up against Toledo, I just think with the guys you're bringing in or the guys you're bringing back, I think with that experience, they'll, they'll be fine. All right. couple of chalk picks back to back. Jake, do you have something different? Or are you chalking with us? Yeah, no, I, I was going to go chalk in my original, but after kind of talking this through, let's lay this out a little bit. The top let's three rushers out. are back from, you got Brown at Northern Illinois, you got Buckley at Western Michigan, and you got Stewart at Bowling Green. Is it not ironic that they are, Northern Illinois predicted third, Bowling Green's fourth, Western Michigan's fifth from like Athlon. What does it tell you? It snows in these in these Mac towns. Like it gets dirty. It gets it gets dirt. It becomes dirty football kind of once it becomes a Tuesday night in November. So I'm gonna pick a team that relies on its running game. Obviously, I have Miami of Ohio in there. I'm gonna go with Bowling Green because I love what they have at the running back position like with Stewart, but What's Basilak? He's got to be in his fifth or sixth year now, Six. isn't he? So Six. he's he's got the upper hand over whatever Toledo's Toledo's going to offer. So you got a run game and you have an experienced quarterback. I think that's going to win you these maxion games when like it gets it. to the nitty gritty. So uh, hey, Miami of Ohio. I'm a fan of that. Green. I'm a fan of that. I wanted to do that and put Bowling Green there because I had a ton of fun just reading about him and learning more about that program. That's because traditionally bad, yeah. but I I couldn't pull the trigger to put him in the Mac title game. I Bowling can't, Green I, gets in some dog fights. Yeah, Toledo's got nothing like after talking through well, it. They don't really have much coming back for him offensively. I no, just don't. And we're we're talking conference title picks right now. This is like my first just probably second or third read through on the Mac. This is probably yeah. not the same title game I'll have when it gets to August and we run through everything and do our uh conference title um picks game. I can't remember what we called that game, but oh yeah, our conference point title. game this. <laughs> yeah, the cover side of point game, great, game but great name for the game. This is going to be this would be when I go back and I really check out. But I do well, think Miami, Ohio is a solidified one that I'll have in it. I mean, the Mac, we're always trying to take a take a shot in the dark, with shot. Like, you know, the fourth or fifth option, because it's probably a decent it's probably a decent guess in this conference. Exactly. All right. That's conference title game picks and winners. Let's talk about players to know. I'll open it up. I mentioned him when I'm talking about Toledo, but Max and Hook is a stud, man. You look, you got, everybody got and got shocked last year where you're watching the first round of the NFL draft, and all of a sudden they say Quinion Mitchell from Toledo, and you're like, what the hell? Somebody from the MAC went in the first round. Who is this kid? I think Max and Hook could be that guy. Three-time All-MAC, 
He posted 70 tackles, missing five games last year. Come on, man. So watch out for that one. That's going to be another guy that shocks you somewhere in the NFL draft. JP. Uh, yeah, for me, it's going to be Harold Fannin Jr., the kid from uh, the tight end from Bowling Green. He's going to be Basilak's favorite target. If he can grab you 50, 60 receptions and just be a reliable guy, he's going to be first team all Mac. It's it's just one of those things where if the tight end's good, man. It helps the offense and quarterback out a ton. And I think he's one you'll see a lot of receptions too on Tuesday nights. I love that. All right, down to Reese. Reese, give us a player to watch in the MAC conference. Well, I just think I mean we've said his name a lot, but I think Bazelak is is a name that everybody recognizes just because of where he was at Indiana. Better than Penix. But better than Penix. That's what I'm saying. But it's I also like give him a, give him a shot. He's still got a year left. Dude, I swear to you, hey, I thought you know, he was going to be. You never know, man. The guy could be a gunslinger. Remember, remember that opening out against Illinois when we took Illinois, but they had the hook or whatever. Yep. Anyway, but I think Bazelak would be a great, great guy for that program. Bowling Green, like, like you say, talk about the Mac every year. It, it, there could be a team in the middle that could just take a shot, and if you get a quarterback that can just not turn the ball over and get the guy get the ball to the guys that he needs to, I think Bazelak can be just fine for this team. Love that pick. All right, down to Shaper to round us out players to watch. Yeah, I forgot to bring this guy up because I've – I, I heard him on a podcast and a Mac preview and I forgot about him. Cause I do remember watching him when Akron and Kent state were playing mm -hmm. last year. Cause I think he had just two terrible penalties, but he's too good. Not to, not to mention, uh, Krishan, I think it's Krishan. They call him big play McCray, Krishan McCray, the receiver at Kent state. He's the one receiver that leads the Mac coming back this year in, in, in yards. He had, I think like, I don't know, 700 last year. Again, not a conference that produces a ton of yards, but I think it's only it's only fair that we we highlight a Kent State player before we put a bow on this. And I honestly <laughs> think he's going to be solid, uh, and he's probably going to get the ball thrown to him a ton because number one, they're going to get be they're going to be getting blown out, and yep. number two, he's probably their only option in that offense. So we'll see if Big Play McCray can get up to 900 yards this year. Big 